Hey guys, uh, it's Gary again, coming to you this time on a Saturday night. Um, one quick addendum to my last uh, epic 75 minute video uh, on Miroslav Vitas. Uh, just looking through a, a, a paper catalog today, uh, oddly enough that my brother-in-law got in the mail. Uh, there's a 1976 Miroslav Vitas uh, album coming out called Majesty Music. Um, that has never been released on CD before uh, in America. It's on the, the Wounded Bird record label, which is is a uh, reissue label. Um, but uh, I'm always a little cautious about their stuff because they've they've done quite a uh, a lot of reissues that weren't that that good and lacking very much information in the booklet that comes with them. And I've even uh, seen reviews of people complaining about the sound quality. Because um, they've even done some reissues of things from the CD age. So not necessarily just older, older things, but even things from the late 80s that went out of print and went back in print. And um, I've heard some things that say that the sound is inferior to the original previous CD release of some of these albums that came out in the late 80s. Um, so, you know, this, this again, this was from 76, so hopefully they won't screw that up so much. Uh, I don't really know much about the album. Um... I know there's a couple players listed on there uh, that I'm familiar with, but um, that didn't help with the 1977 album uh, that had all these high-level jazz players on there that turned out to be a, uh, pretty much an awful funk nightmare. Um, so um, I don't know, you know, that that's really going to happen. I know Lenny White plays on it, so I'm not sure what kind of thing. Uh, Dave Earl Johnson is a conga player. Um, so, and uh, a couple of the titles makes me... Um, a little concerned because there's a track on there called X-Rated. Um, I don't know, you know, it, it's very it's very iffy. And considering in in uh, '77 he made that awful funk album, I'm afraid this might be one of those as well. Who knows? Um, but I just wanted to add that on there. Hopefully, not take up too much time in this video. Uh, this is going to be a short one. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I bother to say that anymore? Um, very much inspired by um, the great Carm Gorvo 31, who did a um, really good video on the Narada label, which was unfortunately uh, an American label, very very short lived. That started in the, uh, I guess in the really with the CD age, so the, the mid to late 80s, and didn't last long. And, and their subdivision labels of you know electronic music, and uh, they had they had some. Um, interesting sub-labels in the main label as well. I was really sorry to see them go and kind of surprised because I know some of those records uh, I thought sold fairly well. But I was kind of inspired by um, by Carm's theme uh, with that label and um, I'm gonna do not something quite as similar but instead of uh, covering a single artist um, I'm gonna do a series of albums from the ECM Records label, of course, what other label, um, when they did their first ever compilations, and they just called them works, or sometimes they were listed and referred to as ECM works. Uh, in interesting history with those. Um, they came out very much at the beginning of the CD era. Now, here in the United States, uh, they were only ever released on CD. And they were marketed here in the States, not necessarily by ECM, but, but by ECM's distribution, I'm assuming, company, their, their American distribution company, um, as essentially uh, like an introduction to CDs, and here's what this new technology can sound like, um, and we want to present some of our artists' work on CD. And see, at the time, since the CD era had just started, new albums on the ECM record label and other record labels were coming out still on vinyl and CD, but ECM had this grand back catalog of, uh, you know, maybe 400 at that point uh, albums that they hadn't yet converted to CD. Some are still waiting to be converted to CD. Um, and so they had this vast back catalog of albums that were no longer going to be available, at least in America, because oddly enough, America this time kind of um, really got behind the, the CD the CD revolution in the format, and very quickly uh, started kind of making plans to discontinue vinyl albums. 
And in the stores, you can see why, for s spatial reasons, um, you can fit a hell of a lot more CDs than you can albums in the same amount of space. Um, so it could have been just for that reason. There, there may have been, uh, obviously CDs cost more. There could have been more of a markup on CDs as well, that I'm not sure of. Uh, but for any number of reasons, the American record stores really got behind the CD uh, revolution at that point and the technology, and kind of the writing was on the wall very quickly. And I guess ECM was probably a little bit afraid that even though they still had their back catalog of vinyl albums available, probably were a little afraid, at least in the U.S., that the um, back catalog orders would possibly stop coming in for albums uh, simply because stores didn't want to stock albums anymore and you know were converting their whole setup to CD racks instead of albums. So kind of maybe as a stopgap, um, in America here it was marketed as let's demonstrate this new technology and we're going to make available compilations by our artists. And um, a lot of uh, obviously older material from these artists were mostly comprised at that time of things that weren't yet available on CD as the full albums. So obviously these are compilation albums by the, their best known various artists. And, um, you know, put, put them out with a lot of material. Some of this material, oddly enough, from the albums that they cherry picked from is still not available on CD in some cases. Uh, though most of it has become available, but it's taken really until recent years for some of these things to come out. Um, so they started with the series, and um, I, I do remember, uh, I remember them coming out and having a big display in a record store, actually. Um, so I, I guess they released a lot of them simultaneously, um, and they got some nice attention from the stores. A few years after they started coming out, I actually started seeing them on cassette, and they weren't heavily advertised as coming out on cassette. And I actually have, still, I, I kept a, a few cassettes. I had a friend at the time that hadn't really gotten behind the whole CD era really until well, like the late 90s and still preferred cassettes for all those years and whenever I could find an ECM works on cassette a uh, great introduction to an artist for somebody who doesn't know them because obviously it's a, a bunch of selections uh, usually with different instrumentation it's not the same one or two or three or four guys on every track so you get a, a little bit of a career overview um, so I would pick up those cassettes for my friend for many many years uh, but at first, I only saw them available on CD. Never saw the cassettes for, for quite a few years uh, after. And um, the one thing I liked about them, I actually have, I don't have them here to show because there's still some CDs, I don't know where they are. But I, I've collected nearly, almost, I might be missing one or two, the entire work series, which they didn't do every single one of their artists. But... Um, they used this cover image. I thought this was a great idea, and I happen to really like the picture. That particular cover in, uh, image of the road, um, they used on every album cover and did variations, and you'll see the variations as I show them. Very interesting. Um, I gotta admit, uh, there, there's something that struck me as weird with these, and I found out the reason for it later on. Um, most of these, nearly all of these, only run a, a, sh a relatively short time. Uh, 42 minutes to 50 minutes for the, there's only one album in the in the collection that actually runs 50 minutes. I thought initially, I thought, well, that's strange because CDs uh, have the capacity of over 70 minutes. And I don't know why um, they limited themselves, especially when you're talking about jazz artists and some of these tracks go on for 8, 9, 10 minutes. Um, if you're restricting yourself to somewhere between I think there's one that actually runs 39 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, relatively short. But somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes, that's not a lot of material to, to choose from. And i got to admit, everybody says this anytime anybody comes out with a compilation album. These aren't the tracks that I would select. Um, there's only a couple artists that I think um, consist of a lot of the tracks that I like. But oddly enough, um, I, I mentioned I have an MP3 player in my car, or my stereo actually plays MP3 compact discs. Um, and I tend to burn a lot of discs myself like this and uh, that, like that one has eight full CDs on there Ru that one runs about seven hours um, but the way that I compress the files uh, I don't compress them too much so you lose sound quality but on a standard um, CDR I get eight and a half hours of music and I actually made um, a couple different um, compilation discs I usually only put one artist on those MP3 discs so I have a lot of albums by these artists 
obviously, to get eight and a half hours worth of material. Um, the only exception was uh, in the ECM Works. I took the Works series and I burned them onto disc. And I have one of the discs have ten of the albums on there, so I'll go show you how short the albums run. Uh, and I don't, it doesn't even run eight and a half hours uh, total for that. Um, but it's a nice, it's a compilation, it's a bunch of different artists, so I have that in my car. So I actually have access to, uh, I have ten on one disc and a bunch on the, the, uh, on the second disc. Um, but like I said, uh, the material is, uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, my tastes are different than everybody else. Uh, in some cases it's not the best. The Jack D. Jeanette one, um, uh, I gotta tell you, there's only one track in here that I would have selected that's absolutely beautiful. A track called Blue, where Jack plays no drums but piano, and it's originally from the Gateway 2 album. And it's a beautiful ballad. He's recorded it several times. The best version of it was the version on the Gateway 2 album, which is here. Um, they have that rock jam. I talked about this uh, on, uh, on the Miroslav Vitas album. From the Miroslav Vitas, Terry Riptal, Jack Dijonet album to be continued. That rock jam that is just really just an improvisation and it's it's awful. Terry Riptal is just basically when it comes time to solo, basically just making a lot of noise. Doesn't sound particularly inspired for some reason. And it's nine nine minutes and twelve seconds. There's only six tracks on here, and unfortunately they chose that track to put on here. So not a great selection um, necessarily. Kind of. Uh, I think the person that compiled this liked louder, more raucous music because most of the tracks are the, the, the more, uh, a couple things from the special edition band, you know, and they're the more freeform saxophone screeching stuff. So the one track, Blue, on here is the only really laid back mellow track. Um, but it's, you know, eh, it's okay. Blue is the one track that I can't live without from Jack Dijonet. Definitely. Um, could be my favorite composition, certainly in, in my top three favorite compositions that he ever did. Um, they didn't put anything from the Pictures album on here, the Jack Solo album, which I would have I would have done. I would have loved to hear that. Um, but you notice the cover, because I'm doing these in a certain order. So here's the painting that adorns. Um, there was basically um, two, two different points that these came out, it appears. They did an initial run of a bunch of the artists, and they followed it up later on with a second run of some of the artists that they missed in the first run. I'm not sure when that second run came, a year or two or three later. Um, and they changed the cover then. But apart from that, uh, the first issues, which was m the majority of the Works albums, have this cover. And here's one that looks like you're driving, you're driving on a road, clearly, and it looks like the sun is coming up and hitting the windshield. Kind of. The next version is uh, Eberhard Weber's and now you've got the same picture and the sun is up a little higher and it's like coming right into your face kind of thing like the, the, the light. So you can see that um, it, it's very subtly changing and I love this, this picture. The first two aren't a real good example of the detail in the painting because of the glare, f the intentional glare factor um, on the album. Again, Eberhard Weber's slightly better in terms of the, the selection of material, I think, than um, then the Jack Dijonet one. This has Sand, which is, they probably chose it for the length, the four minute track from the Yellow Fields album, my favorite track from the Yellow Fields album. Really pretty, great Rainier Bruning House um, synthesizer and keyboards on there. Beautiful track, beautiful Charlie Mariano playing. And it's great because there's not too many four minute tracks that Eberhard Weber did, and not too many that really kind of encapsulate the, the style of the Colors Band. Um, so they've got that. They've got a good track from the Little Movements album, again by Eva Hardweber's Colors. Um, a really good orchestral track called More Colors from the Colors of Chloe. And that one, again, has Rainier Bruning House on piano and a, a string section. And that was from his first album, The Colors of Chloe, which for me was um, kind of hit or miss. But that's probably the best track off of there. So they did a pretty good job with this one. Um, what else? Uh, da 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 Touches on here. Um, oh, Touches the song. I'm sorry. Touches the first song I was thinking of from Yellow Fields that I was talking about, the five minute track. Uh, the track Sand is actually from Ralph Towner's Solstice album. The first track on the album is from Ralph Towner's Solstice album, which Eberhard Weber was a member of that band. 
and um, that's the one track that was written actually by Eberhard Weber on Ralph Towner's Solstice album. So that's on here. So it's interesting because you get a Ralph Towner track essentially with Towner playing. Uh, Eyes I can see in the dark, which is from um, I can picture the album cover, this, the second album after Yellow Fields and between little movements, and I blanked out of what the title is of the second uh, Eberhard Weber Colors album. And uh, Moana 2, which is not the best choice from the following morning album, the beautiful album with Rainier Burning House on keyboards and the string section. I think they only included that one because it's the shortest track on the album. And again, they're, they're, this one only 42 minutes are trying to keep it down. I later, and I will explain, found out why the length of these CDs are so short. Um, so now, we come to Gary Burton's works, and I'm guessing this is kind of meant to be the full-on sunshine in the face kind of thing where it's so bright you almost see things in, in negative. Um, but there's the road, and I'm guessing this is supposed to be at the high point of the brightest point of the day. On that, it's all the same painting, all variations of the same painting. This is a really good selection, by the way. And one of the ones that I, um, I think I have on cassette, and I know I gave to my, my friend on cassette as well years ago, um, it has some tracks that, until recently, I think there was there was um, fairly recently within the last less than a year ago, uh, I want to say the last six months, uh, a couple of the Gary Burton things finally came out that had never been on CD, and um, there's a track, you know, a couple short tracks on here from the Hotel Hello album, which is just a duet album with Steve Swallow, um, so good selection. Uh, the uh, Gary Burton band that had uh, the, the quartet that had uh, Mick Goodrick on guitar and uh, Abe Laboriel on bass and Harry Blazer on drums. They do Choral, which that was a nice album. I think that was from 73. A couple things from... Um, <laughs> I, I forget what albums these originally come from. Desert Air, a, tr a duet track with, with Ch Chick Corea. A couple things from... Um, uh, the, the name of the, the either the Ring album. Uh, let's see. The thing with uh, Abel Boreal is a couple tracks with Abel Boreal, Hen Henry Blazer, and Mick Goodrick on guitar, and Gary Burton on vibraphone from the New Quartet. That was an album from '73. A couple uh, tracks uh, with Chick Corea, or one track with Chick Corea from Crystal Silence, which was a good choice. Um, Dream So Real is the other album I was thinking of. Um, some tracks for there. Uh, seven songs for quartet and chamber orchestra. I think that may have been the one that just recently was finally reissued, if I'm not mistaken. Um, something from uh, Matchbook, which was a, an album um, with Ralph Towner, but this track is just a solo Gary Burton track. Uh, so Ring, Matchbook, and there is there is another track from Matchbook with uh, Ralph Towner on guitar. Uh, Hotel Hello, and there's a couple tracks, a couple tracks from Hotel Hello. Pretty good. That is a good one um, in terms of the selection of material. They kind of crossed a lot of areas. You know, you got some quartet tracks, some quintet tracks, some tracks with actually an orchestral backing, a couple short solo vibraphone tracks, um, duet with Chick Corea, duet with Ralph Towner. So this was a particularly good one. Good, good choice selection uh, on this one. Some of them are very odd um, selections, I think. To be honest with you, and the other one I don't, I don't have here because I forgot where I put his albums. I know where I put his albums. Should I take a break and get it? I'm going to do that, guys. I'm going to do something I never do, and because I know where it is. <laughs> so talk amongst yourself. I'm going to see how quickly I can get back. Just never mind me. Just I won't be long. I know it's I know it's here. See, it was worth doing. It was worth doing. I know where my Ralph Towner and Oregon stuff is. That's you see. Now you know where it is too. You decide to break in and rob me. Um, I have to get in some kind of order. Okay. Well, I'll do this one next then. Ralph Towner. Um, here it looks like we're driving along the road, but we've got some rain or storm or something like that coming, and uh, and the day is the day is progressing. Kind of this is a the, uh, the picture's a little bit out of order now, maybe. Who knows? Um, but you see, again, the variation on the, on the theme. This was a... I happen to really like this one, but it's a very odd choice because even at this time, when these were compiled in the late 80s, or mid-80s, 
Um, Rob Counter had obviously recorded a lot of albums for ECM already at that point, if you look at his history, and they only selected tracks from three albums, which was very strange to me, and they were three of the most well-received albums, which was odd because I thought they would take the opportunity to present albums of his that weren't quite as well-known or didn't sell as well. Uh, maybe the Gary Burton Matchbook album that he did duet with, I don't know if that one was quite as well-known. Um, but I'm thinking mainly the Batik album with Eddie Gomez and Jack DeJunette, which, um, oddly enough, was one of his poorest selling albums on ECM. Um, and that's a great album, and I thought they would throw something on here. For, I mean, I would have. Um, so it's weird. So whoever compiled this album, it almost seems like didn't have a lot of familiarity uh, with Ralph Towner. And although I can't fault any of the choices, there's only six tracks on here. It's a short album. And there's two tracks from each of three albums. Weird. The, the amount of things that they left off, the second Solstice album, the Batik album, the, the two albums that he had made with Burton, though one of them may have not come out yet when this was compiled, I'm not sure. Um, and he recorded a lot. He had a solo concert. Um, wow, he had, done, he had done a lot of albums that are not represented here. Um, what they did is, uh, the, the first Solstice album, they took two tracks from. No problem with the two tracks they selected. Um, they're both really good tracks. But they're almost, it's almost like a greatest hits in a way. It's the things that are, are, are the most, most known by, by Towner. So they got two tracks from the first Solstice album. They're good tracks, no problem with what they selected. Um, and Old, Friend New, Old Friend's New Friends album they selected two tracks from. Again, good tracks. One is a, just a duo with uh, David Darling on cello, Beneath an Evening Sky, beautiful piece. Um, and the other one was the full band that appeared on that album, because that was a five-piece band, actually. Um, with Kenny Wheeler on trumpet, Eddie Gomez on bass, Mike DePasqua on drums, and David Darling on cello, and Towner on guitar. So that was from Old Friends, New Friends, a fairly well-known album by him, and two tracks from my favorite album of his, from Blue Sun. Well, I'm not going to complain because my two favorite tracks from my favorite Ralph Tanner album were on here, but um, it's just weird that with all the albums he recorded for them, they only selected, and they didn't do that with anybody else, um, they only selected material from three of those albums, two tracks each. But my two favorite Blue Sun songs are on here. Uh, the title track, Blue Sun, and uh, The Prince and the Sage. That was an all solo album by Towner where Towner played everything on the album. He even played percussion. He played some, some horns on there. Um, piano, synthesizer, guitars. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know too many examples of Ralph Towner playing percussion on albums. Almost, almost none on his albums on ECM. He may have occasionally done some percussion on an Oregon album. Uh, this is a good select, you know, it, it, it's a good album, I can't fault what's here, but it's an odd choice, it's almost like somebody forgot or didn't even know of 75% of the stuff that Ralph had already recorded at this point with ECM, not even going into how much he recorded after. So that's the picture with the kind of windy, rainy thing going on. Then we come to the Pat Metheny one, which I take it to mean this is the, this is the sun going down, this is like the, the point that this, the that the sun is either really bright coming at you, or it's as the sun is going down. I'm, I'm assuming it's 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 going down, and you get the rich the rich red and pink colors. Um, and um, this for me, volume one, because they actually did a volume two later on. Um, and the only person they did a volume two with, and I guess that's because of his popularity. Because um, it wasn't the amount of material he recorded, because there's people that recorded much more material than Matheny did uh, for the label, and they all only got all these people only got one volume. So I guess this is a, a financial thing, you know. If make money, he had left the label already at this point. The first one, the first volume, has great selections, um, very close to what I would have picked, which is pretty much the only case where that happened. It has my favorite Sunio Con Mexico. I can't pronounce these things, um, from, from his new Chautauqua, I think is how you pronounce it, album, um, solo album, that's my favorite track off of that album, somebody was smart and they put that here, then they put an album from American Garage, which I remember was the first DCM album Carm said he ever heard, because his dad had that album, but I think it's one of the 
poorest, really, ECM albums. It's not particularly a good album. I wouldn't have included that selection. But it's a, a Cross the Heartland, very kind of commercial song on there. Uh, Travels from the Travels album, which was um, kind of just an atmospheric, quiet thing. I, I wouldn't have selected that. Uh, James, the Pretty Ballad from uh, Off Ramp. I wouldn't have selected that either. But, so, um, but from the As Fall Wichita album, It's For You, which is a really nice, nice track. Really nice track. Um, bright Saturday morning sound to it, I always think of when I hear it, especially the opening. And that's just with Lyle Mays on keyboards and Nana Vasconcellos on percussion. That, that's a good track. I would have selected that. Um, the last two tracks on here, though, really make it for me. Because uh, they're both from the 8081 album. I have to admit, a lot of people love that album, and I like it, but I don't think Pat Metheny's playing on there is up to the standard of everybody else. I don't think Pat Metheny, during the improvisations, really sounds like he was on during the time that he recorded that album. It was a double album, and I think there's a lot of filler on that album, to be honest with you. A lot of time when they just had to fill sides. Um, it would have made a really good single album. There's three tracks on there that I love, and two of them are on here. So somebody really knew their stuff, and I believe both tracks are uh, what really originally comprised the fourth side of the album. It, one of them is the only track that is just a solo Matheny track just on guitars that actually more fits in with the new Chautauqua album than it does um, with 8081, which the rest of it was an all-band album with Jackie Schnitt on drums, Charlie Hayden on bass, Dewey Redman on saxophones, and Mike Brecker also on saxophones. Um, the, all those guys all appeared on all the tracks pretty much, um, with the occasional um, switch off between the sax players. But Every Day I Thank You, 13 minute and 15 second song, beautiful on that, the ho absolute highlight of that album. Very pretty, very well written, everybody plays well, and they stuck it on here. And for me, you could basically skip by an 8081. The only other track on 8081 I think, I think that I really like is something called The Bat. Um, and there was a bat part two that later on went uh, on the off ramp album, um, but um, the two really best tracks to me from eighty eighty one are here, and it was like the, the whole original fourth side of that album. So really good choice, um, I thought. You know, I would I've selected four of the tracks I would have left off, but that you know selected something else. But that's just me. But some of the, I can't fault some of the things that they did include on there. Now we're getting into the evening, see. Now you get a good, a better idea of what the detail is actually in the, in the in that original picture. Uh, you can actually see the buildings fully without any kind of glare or anything like that. Um, and I like the I like the I like having these together like that. I think it's a brilliant idea. Egberto Gismonti, um, some good selections. The one, the only selection that I would have included, which they I, they they wouldn't have included on this because they kept these compilations so short. Uh, on his album called Solo, he had this 20-minute guitar piece for his, uh, essentially, it's not a regular, it's not a regular six-string acoustic guitar or 12-string. Um, he plays like these eight-string guitars and these, I don't know, uh, other permeations of guitar. Um, but I believe it's a steel string and, and the guitar on that solo album. There's a 20-minute piece that's absolutely fantastic. I would include that in any compilation, but it's a 20-minute piece. And they didn't, I don't think on any of these, they, they didn't select anything pretty much that long. Um, so, you know, but, they, but there's a good um, selection of, of uh, solo tracks on here. Oh, some tracks with the Magico Trio, which is a good, a good selection, um, which was Jan Garbrick and Charlie Hayden. So that's good. Uh, some examples of, of him playing piano, of Egberto's piano playing as well as guitar playing. And um, nice trio track with uh, Nana Vasconcellos and Colin Walcott. W Walcott. Um, so this was a pretty good uh, sampling of his ECM works. Just leaving off, uh, my particular favorite album of his is, is the album called Solo. And uh, like I said, there's a, you know, you would, I think anybody who's going to listen to Burgos Gizmonti has to have that album. But this is a good introduction. You certainly get the flavor of what he's all about. Um... Next, it's a little bit later, so I hope you notice. I hope you're paying attention to the detail in the play. See, it's getting a little bit later. It's a little darker now. Treasure of the Works. This is a pretty good selection with the sender, um, a track from that a trio album with Polly Mickleborg. 
here playing piano, but is primarily a trumpet player. Uh, John Christensen, my favorite drummer in the world. Um, a decent track from that second um, Rip Dull, Miroslav Vitas, Jack DeJanet album that I tore up because I don't think it's very good. But um, there's a fairly good 3 minute and 47 track here, probably one of the best tracks on that album. So that was a good inclusion. Uh, something from the very early, early days, uh, a track called Rainbow. Um, from one of Terry Rickles very first, if not his first album, one of his very early first albums with ECM. Um, uh, something from the Odyssey album, again, a fairly early album. Um, oh, he's got two tracks from the Descender album. Uh, Insuling, in, Insuling is the way I've always pronounced it. Um, something from Whenever, Whenever I Seem to Be Far Away album, which is a decent choice. Um, and a track also from the Waves album, which was a quartet with Pally Mickelborg and Sveinhung Hovenscho on bass and John Christensen on drums and uh, something real from my one of my favorite albums of his, if not uh, pretty much my number two album. Um, the first 1978 Ripdell, Vetus, and Dijonet album. They do a track from that. This is a pretty good selection, too. I can't complain. The one, the one thing that is a glaring omission for me that's missing from this and is uh, and they could have easily included it because it's an album comprised of a lot of short tracks unlike most of these albums you know where a lot of improvisation stuff nothing from After the Rain nothing from my favorite Terry G. Ripple album ever uh, his all solo album and there's so many tracks on there that you could select and short ones too and I'm sorry for the flashing guys it's the, it's the TV um, that I should have turned off but I was using it for light more than anything else and now it's Something's probably exploding on there or something. Um, and um, this is a good one. This is this is a good one. I actually I, I bought this. This is one that I remember um, buying a CD ed edition of this for for my friend too. Eventually, when he got into CDs, when he decided cassettes weren't weren't it. Um, we progress on to Chick Corea's works. It's getting darker at night. You see that kind of red glow in the evening. That's a pretty version of that, that picture. Um, this one's okay. I'm, I was trying to remember, because I think the only electric keyboards that are on any ECM album by Chick Corea were that first Return to Forever album where Chick played um, electric piano. No synthesizers. Um, but I don't, I don't think that Chick recorded any electric keyboards he, um, at all for ECM, with the exception of that first Return to Forever album. I think he saved those for his American label. Uh, the more fusiony things kind of went to the American label, while Chick almost entirely stayed with uh, the acoustic piano on uh, his ECM works. But you do have one track from the Return to Forever album. It kind of stands out like a sore thumb because it doesn't, it, you know, there's electric bass on there as well. So it doesn't really fit in as much with the aesthetic of the other pieces that are on here uh, because all the other pieces are all entirely acoustic bands but some nice selection of tracks. There's a track called Addendum for Violin, Cello, and Piano, which was originally from Chick's um, ECM album called Children's Songs, which was really good. This, wasn't one of, this track wasn't one of the children's songs, actually. Um, and it was kind of a track that was added on to fill out children's songs, which was just solo piano. Um, but this one has a violin and cello as well, as Chick playing piano. It's a really pretty piece. Great, great choice to include here. Because um, I'm not sure the children's songs are quite as well known, um, that particular album. There's several tracks from uh, his Piano Improvisations Volume 1 and 2 on here. Now, the, both of those albums were recorded um, in the same session in April 71, they were just split up amongst two different volumes. Um, but there's several solo piano tracks. Those are considered amongst the high points of Chick's career. Uh, La Fiesta from the first Return to Forever album, which again, as I mentioned, that's more the up-tempo fusion-y kind of thing with electric piano and um, Stanley Clark on electric bass too and uh, you know drums, percussion, and then saxophone, all that stuff. Um, a really good track it's easily one of my favorite tracks, Brasilia, from an album recorded in 82 that Chick did with Gary Burton, but it's not a duet album. Well, it was essentially a duet album 
with a four-piece string section that consisted of two violins, viola, and cello. Um, and it's from an album called Lyric Suite for Sextet. And my favorite track off of that album, which is a really great album, called Brasilia. And they included that here, so that's a really good choice, along with um, the addendum for violin, cello, and piano from Children's Song, because both of those tracks were absolute highlights of the albums they're from. Uh, a duet uh, with Gary Burton from the original Crystal Violence album, the first duet album, and probably the best known one that um, Chick Corea and Gary Burton did together. And uh, da, 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 two tracks from Trio Music from November 81, and that was Miroslav Vitas on bass and Roy Haynes on drums. There's two albums I completely forgot to mention in my Mir Miroslav Vitas video that I did. They actually recorded three albums together, starting in 1968. Uh, one of the tracks here was actually just a duo uh, without Roy Haynes, so it was just Chick and Miroslav Vitas, and then one is the full trio with um, Chick on piano, Miroslav Vitas on bass, Roy Haynes on drum, drums, and that's, that's a pretty good compilation, just like the Gary Burton one, in terms of um, selections. I would have included, you know, obviously, I would have left off the return to for everything because it, it doesn't fit in with the stuff on here, the electric piano thing. And I'm trying to recall now, um, these came out in 84, right in 84, 85. I don't know if the Steve Kajala album, I forget the duo album that he did with the flautist Steve Kajala, that was roughly from around that time. Um, if it was out, I would have included a track from that because that's a really good album, Voyage, it's called. That's a really good album. I would have included something there, but it may have been a brand new album at that time, and they were highlighting older material. But a, a pretty good selection for Chick. Next up, it's getting darker and it's getting later, just like it is here. Jan Garbrick's works. You see it's getting a little darker, now fog is setting in. Um, this, I'm glad they included some of the tracks here that they did. Um, they included some things from that Magico trio that I mentioned um, from the Egberto Gismati Works album. Um, the two albums they recorded there together originally. I know they came out with a live album many years later. Um, but they got something from um, Folk Songs here, one of the Magico albums. And um, a, good, a good choice with uh, Jan Garbrick, Egberto Gismati on guitar, Charlie Hayden on bass. Um, something from the Dance Here album, which is just not a track that I would have included because it's basically just Garbrick shrieking for 90 seconds. Um, so I would I would definitely skip that track. Um, an odd choice, something from the from the 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 Places album, um, which I talked about in the Bill Connors video, a quartet. This was Garbrick's quartet group, the Young Garbrick group. Uh, the only time he recorded with Jack Dijonet on drums as a leader, anyway. Uh, John Taylor playing organ, Bill Connors on guitar, Jan on, on saxophone, and that's a lesser, I think, I, Places, from the Places album. I think that's a slightly lesser known album by, by Jan Garbrick. So that was a good um, choice, I think. This, there is a track from this, D-I-S, mm. um, which is a duo album with Ralph Towner and Jan Garbrick. Good, I think a good choice to include something from that album, because again, I don't think that album is as well known. And I can't find my vinyl of that. I'm very upset because uh, when I was doing the Miroslav Vitas thing, I was constantly going through the same bins over and over again. And I'm like, I know I've got that album. on. I, I know I have it on CD, but I know I have it on vinyl and I can't find it. There's also a couple things from his earlier days that are a little bit rougher sounding. Um, things from 1970, 72 from Afric Pepper Bird, Berg, Bird, B-A-R-D. Um... Uh, there is one. There is one nice quartet track from the Dancier album, which was the Bobo Stenson group with Pally Danielson on bass, John Christensen on drums, Bobo Stenson on piano, and Jan Garbrink. And a track from a, an album I really like, um, Adventure, which was uh, an interesting trio album with um, no bass player but uh, John Abercrombie on guitar, Nana Vasconcellos on percussion. The track they included here only is a duet with um, Jan Garbrick on flute and Anna Vasconcellos on percussion, but it's a cool track. It's a really, really nice track. So, you know, again, there's tracks I would leave off there in favor of others, but nobody asked me. And I would have included more Jan Garbrick um, group material, I think. 
uh, Keith Jarrett works. Well, Keith Jarrett's going to be a tough one because of all these guys at this date in the in the early '80s, the early mid '80s, Keith probably recorded more actual albums for ECM probably than anybody else. Chick Corea recorded a bunch. Pat Metheny didn't do as many as I think people think he did, um, at least for ECM. But um, this was a tough. That's a, this is a tough choice, and again, almost like the um, Ralph Towner one. I think it was a little bit odd. Um, that it seems like they really favored a handful of albums to the exclusion of, of some others because th there's two tracks from the My Song album and together they're over 15 and a half minutes which is over a third of the CD um, there's naturally you have to have uh, and the My Song album is a, is a quartet thing with Jan Garbrick on saxophone, Pally Danielson on bass and John Christensen on drums Nothing particularly wrong with it, but it's a very popular album by him, I thought. And uh, oh, again, you know, we're getting really into the late night here, which I like. Um, at least that's my interpretation of the cover art. Um, so you know, the, the my song album I thought was was kind of, again, like the Ralph Towner things. It seems like they're they're making selections from more well known albums instead of taking advantage, I think, and and putting stuff on from the lesser known albums. Uh, there's some early, early solo piano things. Uh, an excerpt from Facing You on solo piano, which was 1971. An excerpt from S the Staircase album, a solo piano album, too, which is about eight minutes long, which is really good. Um, and Staircase is, is a lesser-known solo album. Uh, it's just a single disc, maybe 40 minutes or so, um, disc of solo piano. And because Keith did so many extensive multi-disc sets of solo pianos, uh, it seems like the Staircase album is is uh, kind of got obscured a little bit by by later larger packages. They included a short five minute track, uh, the second movement of a string quartet from the In the Light album, which I really love the fact that they included that because In the Light is a really obscure Keith Jarrett album. Could be the hardest Keith Jarrett album to get into. Certainly, I would say certainly the hardest. ECM Keith Jarrett album to get into. He may have had some more free jazz kind of stuff um, when he was on Impulse or the various other labels he was on prior to ECM, but um, In the Light is mainly things uh, that he wrote for various combinations of orchestras and other musicians, and some of which he doesn't even play on himself. Double album set, which I happen to really like, but it's a hard listen. You have to be in the mood for it. A uh, nice uh, example of his um, invocations, the Moth and the Flame album that he did, where he played pipe organ and soprano saxophone. Again, not a track I think that from an album that's as well known. So it's nice to have uh, him playing the pipe organ, soprano saxophone. So the entire album isn't just him playing acoustic piano. Uh, an excerpt from the Sun Bear concerts. That's tough. It's a long concert. Um, to excerpt three minutes and 48 seconds. I don't know how you do that. that. That's a little tough. But again, not a bad selection. But don't know why they, ex they obviously excluded a lot of albums and why they would include two tracks making up about a third of the album from the My Song album when others went kind of ignored. Again, it's a little bit of an oddity. And uh, like I said, I have, I think there's a, there's a few others that I didn't dig out because I don't know where the artists are. Um, but they had this initial rash. I think all those albums pretty much came out in a very tight period, close together. A bit later on, they had a second edition of Works and um, decided uh, a couple years later, I guess uh, maybe even more than a couple years later, um, they decided to do another selection of Works and they, they changed the cover. And this cover is weird because it looks, it really isn't, but it looks again like it's variations on the same cover, but it's not. It looks like a view out of a windshield of a car and various crap being thrown at the windows, which makes no sense to me. Like the windshield is full of garbage. Maybe somebody's interpreting this something else than I am. I don't know. Um, and initially, it looks like it's variations like the first painting was. But it's not because if you look at the trees and all that, they're not uh, actually on the other, on the other albums. So they filled in some artists that they had missed uh, in the second round. So they did Bill Frizzell. It may be an odd choice because Bill Frizzell, as a leader, did not record a lot of albums for them, and they were excluding some people that did record a lot of albums for them. 
And um, one of the artists that I'm missing here. Oh no, uh, never mind. Um, but they did uh, include some some really nice stuff. They included a couple good tracks that he recorded with Paul Motion as um, part of his band. So that was a good selection. Because again, maybe those albums aren't as well known or people didn't realize Bill Frizzell played on them, I'm not sure. But naturally, they included things from In Line, my favorite Bill Frizzell album, which was his first solo album. And the albums that came after where he had uh, larger bands with people like Kenny Wheeler and uh, Jerome Harris uh, on bass and um, doo -doo 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 -doo, Bob Stewart on tuba so so a few uh, a few things there um, a trio thing with Paul Motion and uh, Joe Lovano on saxophones I'm pretty sure that that, you know, that one's from a from a Paul Motion album um, and uh, a pretty decent selection um, I mean if I'm gonna go to a Bill Frizzell album I still go with In Line his first solo album but um, this was a pretty good selection but again he only had a few albums that he recorded as a leader for ECM and a bunch more as a band member in Paul Motion's band so it was smart to include some of that material here and again you see that cover and then we get to John Abercrombie which is strange that they didn't include John Abercrombie with the original one you see a very similar vibe there going it, it looks like you're driving in a car and that's maybe a windshield and there's crap being thrown at the windshield but you could see there's no trees now. You got like a building in the in, in the background and stuff, but it's the same aesthetic, the same idea for a cover. I just don't understand it. Um, I like the first cover, uh, the, you know, the original series. Um, the John Abercrombie one. Uh, it was strange because he's been recording with them for so long. One of those guys that still records for them and was a very early member of their roster. Um, but again, they're they're selecting maybe a couple. Uh, tracks that I wouldn't necessarily put on here. Um, they did two tracks from Timeless, and they're the more up-tempo, jammy, fusiony ones. And really, to me, that's not real representative of most of John's solo work. He played fusion prior to his solo career starting, but for the most part, um, apart from his the, the, his first solo album, Monty CM, which was Timeless, the fusion stuff kind of got dropped. Um, so to include two tracks there is maybe a bit much. Um, something from his Night album, which was at that point one of the newer albums, because that came out in 84. And again, that was with Jan Hammer and um, Jack DeJeanette and Mike Brecker. And that was also a little bit more of a fusion-y thing. And one of the few times he kind of revisited that. But they were smart because they included one track from my favorite album of his, Characters, John's only all solo album. Uh, a track called Backward Glance, but it doesn't matter what track you selected from that album. They're all great. But Backward Glance is a particularly pretty uh, ballad from that album. They should have probably selected another one. Uh, from Arcade, uh, John's first working quartet with uh, Richie Byrock on piano, George Mraz on bass, Peter Donald on drums, uh, a track called Night Lake, which was actually written by Richie Byrock. Good, good selection. And to this day, the only way you can get a, a CD, at least right now, of, of the arcade album is as an expensive Japanese import. I don't know why ECM themselves didn't put it out, um, but twi on two different occasions. They licensed it out for a Japanese company to issue on CD, and yet ECM themselves didn't issue it on CD. So, and supposedly they were going to come out with um, a three CD set of his quartet material with this band with the same guys stayed the same Richie Byrock, George Mraz, Peter Donald and it still hasn't come out. I don't know what it's waiting for or if they decide not to go with it. I uh, did a track uh, from Gateway 2, good selection. A duo track with Ralph Towner, good selection from five years later, the second album they did together. I would have selected something from Sargasso Sea, which is an album that I like much, much better than the five years later follow-up album, but that's just me. And a really good track Credited to the entire group for a Jack DeJeanette album, which is odd. Credited to the entire group that plays on it uh, from Jack DeJeanette's 1978 New Directions album. One of my favorite Jack DeJeanette albums of all time. With uh, John Abercrombie on guitar, Jack on drums, Lester Bowie on trumpet, Eddie Gomez on bass. And this must have been an improv because all four members are credited with the writing. Uh, Dreamstalker. Good, mysterious vibe, good selection. Um, I would have probably, to be honest, left off the material from the Timeless, the Fusion-y stuff from the Timeless album, and um, 
put more maybe another track on from uh, the characters album certainly from something from Sargasso Sea the beautiful duet album with Ralph Towner uh, keeping up with um, the theme but again a different picture but once again it looks like you're driving in a car and somebody's throwing crap at your windshield if anybody else has a different interpretation of that let me know Lester Bowie didn't record that many albums as a leader for ECM um, so that was a really strange out of left field choice um, he recorded an album called The Great Pretender, uh, an album called Avant Pop, this is as a leader, uh, an album called uh, I Only Have Eyes For You, and an album called All The Magic. But those are the only ones that I know of that he recorded as a leader for ECM, so you know, with only four albums, it's a bit strange that they would do a Lester Bowie uh, compilation like this. Um, but they do include a track from the Art Ensemble of Chicago, which Lester Bowie is a member of. So that was a that was a good selection. Um, I was I was a bit surprised that they didn't include something from uh, Lester Bowie playing with the Jack Dejanet band that I just mentioned that John Abercrombie was part of uh, the New Directions band because they recorded two albums, a studio album and a live album, um, with that same lineup with Lester Bowie and John Abercrombie and Jack Dejanet on drums and. Um, was a little surprised that they didn't include a, a track from, from Jack DeJanette because it's, you know, Lester Bowie's playing all over the place on that one. Um, so, but they do include an art ensemble of Chicago track, which, you know, they recorded a few albums for ECM, but still I was a little surprised to see a Lester Bowie one come out. The last one in this batch, not the last one I have, I think, I think I'm, I'm missing a couple from my selection, was, uh, as I mentioned, Volume 2. They came out with the Pat Metheny Works Volume 2, the only guy that got a second one. Uh, second volume, and you know, again with the the newer cover of the crap being thrown at the windshield or whatever. Um, unlike the first Pat Metheny one, which had a really good selection, I'm kind of disappointed by it. They they did select um, one really good track from the trio album that uh, Pat did with Charlie Hayden and uh, Billy Higgins on drums. Probably my favorite track from that album. And it's called Story from a Stranger, and that was from an album called Rejoicing, recorded in November 83. That's a really good selection to include on this album. And um, also from Pat's second album as a leader, and his second ECM album, called Watercolors, they, they uh, selected Oasis, which is a beautiful, quiet piece with just Pat Metheny on guitars and Eberhard Weber on boat bass. That was a good selection. They also include some early stuff from Bright Size Life, which I'm, um, you know, it's it's okay, but you know, maybe they, it was probably smart. They included a couple tracks there because it was a lesser known album of his, being his first solo album. Probably is, is not as well known, um, but it's it's a bit strange because they include three tracks from Bright Size Life. That's kind of a lot for the amount of material that he recorded with them. Um, one track from Travels as well, uh, the live album with the Pat Metheny group. But considering you've got an album of only seven tracks, to include three from the same album, Bright Size Life, that's a bit odd. And they include and they include a 14 and a half minute track uh, from the 8081 album. And it's interesting as a musician to listen to because it's called a track called Open. It's a total improvisation, so you get to hear them make up stuff on the on the on the spur of the moment. Um, Charlie Hayden on bass, Jack Dijonet on drums, and both Dewey Redmond and Mike Brecker on saxophone. But musically, honestly, I have to be honest, it, it, Pat Metheny doesn't play great on it. He just basically does a whole bunch of runs on, on the neck of the guitar that really don't mean anything on that track. Um, and the other people soloing are more interesting. But it's not a composition, and it's not even a track that, uh, like most jazz tunes, you know, there's a theme, they improvise around the theme, and they go back and they play the theme. This is just a total freeform thing. And I think it's, and I can understand it, because there's times when I don't even want to hear it. Um, I wish they would have included The Bat, which is the only track that they left off from the 8081 album from the first Pat Metheny Volume 1 compilation that I really like. Open is almost like it's just filling time on the on the disc, I think, for a lot of people. A lot of people are going to be a, a hard listen. Um, I like the track at times because you know that they're totally making it up on the spot. And um, years later, they came out with a uh, compilation called Rarum, which I have a selection of, but not that many. Uh, another best of compilation of, of many of their artists. Um, that is interesting in a lot of ways, and those are still 
pretty much in print. Um, because this time they allowed the artists to select the album themselves, what they thought was their best work. Oddly enough, sometimes I think their selections are really poor. Like, it's like, this is really what the artist thinks is their best work on ECM? Well, I would have selected, like, none of those tracks. So it's interesting, from that point of view, the Rarum, R-A-R-U-M collection. Um, why did I choose to show works? Uh, for a couple reasons. Um... Like I said, when Works first came out, it was taunted here in, in the U.S. as being uh, basically demonstrating what CDs are capable of sound-wise, wise, and here's a presentation of a sampling of our artist's back catalog and what it sounds like on ECM, blah, blah, blah. They never made mention of why it came out on cassette as well, which I didn't see until years later. The thing I wondered about this collection, though, is why the short running time? There's only one album that even hits 50 minutes which is the amount that you could fit on an LP. Ah, well, it turns out that in Europe, initially, they also released these on LP. So the reason necessarily for doing the works thing, as we were told in America, was not to really demonstrate the capabilities of the CD medium, but rather to maybe do a career overview, or simply as a smart marketing move, like I said earlier, because they were afraid that we don't have the time to transfer all of our back catalog now to CD, and we're afraid that we're going to lose a lot of sales. Um, the record stores aren't going to necessarily order the old back catalog on vinyl, so we better put something out there to maybe fill the gap a little bit until we can get these albums out on CD, and you know maybe not potentially lose a lot of money on the back catalog stuff. It was a smart move to do, but I had no idea for many, many, many years until I started seeing imports, um, and maybe even saw it listed on the ECM Records website, that um, these things were issued on vinyl, hence the running time of 40 to 50 minutes, because that's what you could fit on vinyl. So I finally got an understanding for why these compilations ran so short. They still, in my mind, should have included more t material, at least on the CDs. Fine, you want to come out with the vinyl, that's fine, but then throw in more tracks on the CD, because you're nowhere near the... You're, over at least, in, you're between 30 to 40 minutes less than what a CD can hold on all of these. Um, and these appear to be out of print now on, on CD, so why am I even presenting these? Well, I have noticed a bit in, in the past, like all of a sudden, uh, when you go online, there, there will still be some new copies that crop up every once in a while on CD. I'm not sure that they're necessarily being manufactured, but there may be various warehouses around where they're finding some small stashes of some of these albums on CD that were unsold. Uh, you're also seeing a lot, a lot of used copies of these available, which makes sense because they were pretty much put out there for any record store that had any ECM selection at all. We're going to probably grab these because they're compilation albums. Why not? Um, so I've seen those uh, coming up, there's a lot of used copies on CDs. In some cases, depending on varying from album to album, uh, some new copies on CD. And oddly enough, though, in recent years, these were already out of print when I saw this start to happen. Um, they started making these available for downloads, which was the newest thing. So, smart, a smart marketing move, because you're not spending any money on the manufacturing aspect of it. As soon as those files are converted and they're sitting on the server somewhere, you can just make money off them. So the, the albums are available as downloads. And the odd thing is, I started seeing, not necessarily with all of them, but with some of these albums, all of a sudden came in print again on vinyl. Uh, and I've seen them in the U.S. available, and I'm not sure, I don't think they're imports, but the primary place to get these on vinyl, and probably have more of a selection than we do in the U.S., would be ECM Direct uh, Records directly in Germany. Um, but it seems like, I guess with the vinyl revolution kind of coming up, um, that they decided to put, it, it's odd that they would put some of these albums back in print on vinyl and not make them available on CD. Now, the cassettes were deleted long ago. You could figure out why. You know, I don't know too many people buy cassettes anymore. Um, the CDs were oddly out of print. Um, the downloads all of a sudden became available, and it's weird. In the last like year or so, all of a sudden I started seeing vinyl becoming available for some of these again. Um, so interesting, because ECMs is not 
generally, uh, I, I didn't think ECM would go back to that older technology, oddly enough. So it's interesting that they, they seem to be making some of these available on vinyl. And because of the number of, of copies that are out there, uh, which is why I did this video, um, I thought I would I thought I would mention it. Um, didn't want to do the rare room series yet. I don't really have a, a huge selection of the rare room stuff, um, and uh, you know the works things are fairly cost uh, effective to buy those. Uh, great introductions to the artists if you don't have them. And uh, I want to thank Carm for the inspiration because he did the Narada thing, which got me on an idea of doing a kind of a thematic thing that involves multiple artists. I never thought this would run an hour. I can't stop. Um, sorry, guys. I, I did this one, <laughs> once again, thinking it would be a short one that we could get through very quickly. Um, so you wouldn't be sitting here for an hour. And now you have been. Okay. Um, that's it for now. Late Saturday night now. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Um, if you have the work series, uh, I'd love to see what your comments are. Uh, disagree with me as far as my selections or you know the ones I like, the ones I don't like, if you have them. Um, guys, thanks for watching as always. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'll be back soon. And uh, thanks, thanks for watching and for commenting.